These are the foods with the most evidence stacked against them when it comes down to mitochondrial damage. The mitochondria is the root of our metabolic issues. Type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all of these are mitochondrial issues. So when we look at being overweight, or when we look at these things, we say, oh, well, it's a calories in, calories out equation. It is absolutely for sure, but when you also look at the mitochondria's ability to produce and manufacture energy, if you cannot produce energy properly because you have damaged mitochondria, how do you think that impacts your energy balance of what you consume and what you actually generate energy out of, right? It's flat out important to know. So the first food that is damaging for the mitochondria is going to be the food that fuels the mitochondria the most, sugar. Now I know that's generic and you probably wanna click off this video, but check this out, because there was a study published in Diabetology. And this is fascinating because it found that type two diabetes is much more of a mitochondrial dysfunction disease than anything else. And they found that it's bi-directional. And what that means is that it's not just the sugar causing insulin resistance. It's the mitochondria being damaged from other things, which we'll talk about, that therefore impedes its ability to utilize glucose and thus begins a terrible cycle. So they found that type two diabetes doesn't just make you insulin resistant. It literally reduces the mitochondria's ability to manufacture energy. It reduces the electron transport chain. It reduces the respiration. It increases the reactive oxygen species and decreases the literal, literal energy output. So it's like taking a motor that is a 500 horsepower motor and turning it into a 200 horsepower motor, but emitting those extra 300 horsepower that it lost as like just nasty exhaust. You basically have created a low performing mitochondria that just produces stress. But we have to look somewhat in vitro and rodent model stuff on almost all these foods because we're still early. We can't take a large cohort of people, especially like epidemiological stuff, we can't just like take that to the bank. So we do have to get a little fringy, but that's fine because I'm not telling you not to eat something. I'm not telling you not to eat glucose, but I am telling you that it does seem to be problematic when it's in excess. So this study was published in the journal Molecular Sciences. When they treated mitochondria with high amounts of concentrated glucose, they found that high amounts of glucose in one sitting fragmented the mitochondria. So it changed the actual phenotype and changed the structure, but then secondarily, it reduced the energy production. So it damaged the mitochondria so much that it just it basically put rocks in the engine block to the point where this thing was not able to produce energy as much. How do you think that that's gonna result? Like when you actually consume food and the mitochondria can't produce enough energy out of it, you're going to store more, right? So all these things come full circle, right back to weight loss, obesity, you name it. But now let's move to another piece, another food that actually even has more cards stacked against it. It's fructose but I'm not talking about eating a pear. I'm not talking about even diving into a giant bowl of watermelon, to be honest. I'm talking about the kind of fructose that we consume in our consolidated forms, in our sodas, in our high fructose corn syrup, in our processed foods, in our preserved foods. This is a serious issue. And that diabetology study actually focused more, the one I referenced earlier, focused more on fructose than it did on glucose. That's fructose being more problematic. But let's take a look at some rats because everyone loves rats and that's where a lot of these metabolic studies start. But let's look at this paper. This was published in Lipids in Health and Disease and it divided rats into four groups. They had a control group, then they had a high fat group, then they had a fructose group, a high fructose group, and a high fructose and fat group. The only ones that ended up with mitochondrial dysfunction were the fructose groups and the high fructose and fat groups. So it wasn't the fat, it was either the combination of fats and fructose or fructose. Those were the groups and the same amount of mitochondrial dysfunction they had was the same amount of liver cell damage that they had. We've heard in other contexts that high fructose diets could be bad for the liver. It can damage the liver cells. That is not anything that's new. Okay, but when you see it line item like directly correlated with the same amount of mitochondrial dysfunction, what it demonstrates to us is that potentially we are damaging the mitochondria within the liver so much that the liver is losing function and therefore starts to store energy rather than burn it 
and you start storing fat in the liver and you have that visceral fat and that liver fat. That is hugely problematic. Now the mechanism in which this happens is probably through advanced glycation in products because when you have a Maillard reaction, when you have uh, fructose or sugar that basically reduces down with lipids, it turns into this like glycated, caramelized onion type thing in your cells really. Now, advanced glycation in products are definitely a known issue, but fructose is one of the biggest activators of this. But fructose is one of the most potent agents for AGEs. So fructose glycates very easily. So when you have a high degree of this, it can damage the mitochondria. Now, additionally, when you have advanced glycation in products that form, especially in high concentration, it impairs insulin signaling, okay? So it leads to further metabolic issues and inability to process glucose by taking in too much fructose. And it also activates these receptors on the membrane, literally known as rage receptors, like appropriately named. And they literally start the process of breaking down the mitochondria and making it dysfunctional. So when these receptors on the mitochondria get activated by advanced glycation in products, it signals the mitochondria to sort of self-destruct. What does this look like to you? Okay, you drink a bunch of high fructose corn syrup, you drink a bunch of sodas, and eventually, even if you're probably not in energy excess, it could be problematic, right? It, you are giving yourself so much of a concentrated fuel that it's damaging your mitochondria, and it may not affect you today. It may not affect you five years from now, but it could affect you 10 years from now. And that's, again, based on mechanistic research, so we can't 100% take it to the bank. This next one is gonna raise eyebrows, and those of you that are in the evidence-based community might not like what I have to say about seed oils. And those of you that are in more of the biohacking world might really like what I have to say about seed oils, but I encourage you to hear this whole piece because I think we'll find some common ground. I am not in one camp or the other with seed oils, to be honest with you. I don't really think that they're as awful as some people make them seem, but I also don't think that they're perfectly benign. Now, what this study demonstrates is something that I've speculated for years and years and years. This study was published in the journal Lipid Research. It was done on rats, full disclaimer. But what it did is it looked at a low linoleic acid diet, a high linoleic acid diet, and a high oxidized linoleic acid diet. You know what they found? Linoleic acid, seed oil, like from safflower, sunflower, cottonseed, corn oil, it actually wasn't problematic. It didn't cause any mitochondrial dysfunction, but oxidized linoleic acid caused a whole host of problems, including huge amounts of mitochondrial dysfunction. They also found that it completely reduced the complex expression to be, for the mitochondria to be able to produce energy and ultimately reduced ATP. But linoleic acid did not, only oxidized linoleic acid. So you know what this is? These are the seed oils that are in industrialized like crap. They're the seed oils that are being used in fast food restaurants, heated to high temperatures, almost certainly oxidized. I don't think it's problematic for you to go have a sunflower seed. I don't think it's problematic for you to have a cup of sunflower seeds. I think it is problematic to have an oxidized oil in any form, let alone one that is so fragile and easily oxidized like linoleic acid. The other thing that's interesting is they did see a huge increase in the NLRP3 inflammasome in the rats that had the oxidized, but not in the other groups. So it increases in inflammation. They also had an increase in apoptosis basically within the mitochondria. So it increased a kinase that would tell the mitochondria to self-destruct and basically kill, just die. So huh, with all this, we're like, okay, this huge oxidized stressor that comes in from these oxidized oils is so bad that it can alter the mitochondria to be less efficient and even self-destruct and be gone. What do these oils look like? Well, safflower oil is about 78% linoleic acid. Sunflower, about 73. Then you get down the line a little bit more. Cottonseed, I think, is like 61. Then you have corn oil at like 59. Soybean oil being around 51. Soybean oil is problematic in and of itself because it's heavily oxidized all the time. And people might say some things about the xenoestrogens and phytoestrogens, whatever. But when it comes down to the linoleic acid, that's where we're starting to see the most literature. But again, it comes down to the oxidized form. So is it problematic to have maybe some grape seed oil and like, I don't know, keep it in a dark cabinet and drizzle it over something? I don't think that's a big deal, but you have to ask yourself like for the same amount of money, you could probably use avocado oil at this point. So why wouldn't you go for something that is a more stable fat? I think it's a better overall effect to really lean into that. 
One thing that is kind of an interesting mitochondrial support agent that is getting more and more attention now, believe it or not, is creatine. Creatine has a way of protecting the mitochondria because it can actually potentially modulate inflammation in some ways. Creatine is not for building muscle. Creatine is an energy building supplement. And when you provide your body with available creatine, you can create energy via this phosphate system, which actually allows the mitochondria to have potentially less stress. So it's kind of funny that, yes, a healthy diet, exercise, good amount of protein, all these things are tremendous for the mitochondria, but one of the least expensive, most researched, most backed, most efficacious and safe supplements that's out there, creatine, might be one of the more powerful mitochondrial support agents that you could ever have. It's pretty cool. And full disclaimer, I put a sponsored link down below for Create, which is a no sugar added allulose sweetened creatine gummy. So these are one and a half gram servings per gummy. So you can low dose creatine, take a couple gummies per day versus having to have a big heaping scoop of like five grams and deal with water retention and the other stuff that can potentially come with creatine. Personally, I take one to three gummies and I space them throughout the day and I find I don't get the water retention because I am very sensitive to it. But also improves my brain, it seems to improve my strength, which is definitely no surprise at all. But I also do it as, in my own weird way, a longevity supplement because I feel like it's protective and it's helpful for my, my, my mitochondria, it's helpful for energy production. So that special link down below gets you 50% off. So again, that's 50% off. So huge discount down below, top line of the description underneath this video for create creatine allulose sweetened gummies. Saturated fat in the absence of protein. This is wild, okay. So it's like, I wouldn't recommend just cutting off the ribbon of fat from a ribeye steak and eating just the fat. This study was published in the journal Cells, Rodent Model Research, okay? And what they had them do is they had them consume either a high protein diet or a low protein diet. And then within that, they had them consume either high saturated fat or low saturated fat. What they ultimately found here is that saturated fat damaged the mitochondria, but only when protein was low. When protein was high, saturated fat didn't seem to have an impact. There wasn't a negative impact on the mitochondria. The low protein and higher saturated fat group had not only mitochondrial dysfunction, but mitochondrial swelling. This mitochondria was actually under stress. And if we look at some more literature that's more mechanistic, we might have an understanding as to why. It might have something to do with the types of saturated fat that come in from protein itself. Like if you ate meat, the saturated fat might be a different kind of saturated fat. But also, there's almost a food matrix that's involved. Like it's not normal for us to maybe just consume a bunch of saturated fat in one sitting, but it is possibly normal for us to consume saturated fat with protein. So this study that was published in the journal Lipids Research was interesting because they found that the longer carbon chain fats, like the C16s, the 18s, the C20s, these required what is called a palmitoyl transferase to get into the uh, mitochondria. For whatever reason, this delay or this period of time caused it to elicit more damage to the mitochondria, whereas shorter chain saturated fats, C10, C12, C14, C15, these incorporated and absorbed into the mitochondria easier and were directly able to be used as fuel. So less damage and more just overall fuel. So the, the actual carbon chain length of a saturated fat matters. Who would have ever thought that we'd be dividing saturated fats into different kinds of saturated fats. Maybe this is what we need to learn for a lot of things, not just mitochondrial health and metabolic health, but possibly even atherosclerosis and whatnot. And the last one, which is a very interesting one and very controversial, is gluten. Okay, so gliadin is the primary protein in gluten. Now, full disclaimer, what we have here is purely mechanistic, but there is something with gluten that a lot of people do not tolerate well. We don't entirely know what it is. Is it glyphosate? Is it this? Is it that? Is it intolerance? Is it celiac? Well, there's a lot of people that don't have celiac that still can't handle gluten very well. They get issues. People that have autoimmune issues definitely seem to have issues with gluten. My wife is one of them, but I can't come out here and say, don't eat gluten because it would be unfair and it would be unrealistic based on the literature that's out there. However, some mechanistic stuff starts getting us wondering. There's a study published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. They created 
a gut barrier out of intestinal epithelial cells and they soaked it, they exposed that to gliadin, the protein and gluten for 24 hours. They found mitochondrial dysfunction and overall epithelial cell damage. The mitochondrial DNA was literally damaged and there were increases in oxidative stress. So with something happening metabolically, possibly with gluten, but this is in vitro stuff, so we can't take it to the bank. But then there was a study earlier that was published in the Journal of Biochemistry and Molecular Toxicology. They took intestinal cells and exposed them to gliadin as well. Okay, quote, gliadin protein induces oxidative and nitrosative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, and it damages cellular biomolecules in intestinal cells. These are in cells, in tissue models, not in actual rodents or people but something is going on there that we may want to be a little trepidatious about. The bottom line is maybe we're not supposed to be consuming this much gluten. Maybe all the wheat products we consume, maybe it's just too much. There is a thing called metabolic gridlock. And if we consume a bunch of fats and a bunch of carbs in high caloric value at one time, the mitochondria and our body in general wants to preferentially run on one fuel or the other when there's a surplus like that. If you have a one-way street to utilize a fuel, and you are trying to get one fuel in, but there is something blocking the one-way street, you're gonna have this gridlock. It's gonna form traffic. And that's potentially gonna lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, possibly more fuel accumulation. It's something to consider. And it's not gonna happen if you consume a banana along with fatty piece of steak, but it might indeed happen if you consume a thousand calories worth of Twinkies of linoleic acid and sugar combined. That's a lot of fuel from a lot of different angles all at once. We have a crisis of abundance happening. Too much around us and too much inside us. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.